Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Beth Schultz. I'm Social Ministry Committee Chair, and um, this is our third Sunday of the month event. And, and I'd like to thank you for coming to, to hear about some of what the people in our church are doing as far as social ministry things. Um, and so the people that are invited today have been uh, Diane Dubois from Benedict Center, and I just want to, I did a little bit of research yesterday because I didn't know anything really about these organizations, and Diane will fill you in more, but its mission at Benedict Center is to work with women who are victims, offenders, and community, and the community to achieve a system of justice that is fair and treats everyone with dignity and respect. So that's the mission of Benedict Center. And then for Serenity Inns, we have Kelly Kirtley here. And she is going to talk about their mission to provide structured housing and rehab services in an environment of support and accountability that will give addicted men the opportunity to rebuild their lives. That sound good? Okay. And Kelly will tell you how she's involved in that. And then, um, I do not know, um, we had asked Kristen Hansen to come and talk about Tosa Cures, but her health has not allowed her to do that. And Gretchen Housley maybe will show up to do a talk about Tosa Cures, but I'm not sure. So that may or may not happen. And then uh, repairs of the breach. So if you see ROTV on anything that's repairs of the breach, and Trudy Dunner is going to talk about that. Can you stay, Trudy, or do you yes. have to go back down? Are you here now? Okay, good. We, Parents of the Breach actually has its 30th anniversary this year, and it started as a newspaper for the homeless and now provides programs and services to the homeless. And Trudy will tell you what she does with Repairs of the Breach. And then finally, um, we have Michelle Burmeister from the Siebert Foundation. And I thought the Siebert Foundation had an interesting um, way of describing what its mission is, that the ministries are to grow the body of Christ, educate while sharing the gospel, and serve as the hands and feet of Christ. So that's just like, you know, when you hear God's work, our hands, um, the synod mission. It's kind of the same thing. So it'll be interesting to hear how Michelle describes what Siebert Foundation does. And so what we'll do is we'll do the speeches in that order, and then when everybody is done, we'll have a question and answer period, and I'll have the people who spoke come up in front and answer the questions into the microphone, and that will um, be easier for the people who are watching the videotape show to understand. So we'll start with Diane Dubois from Benedict Center. And we have no signal. Is your computer sleeping? I saw it do that. I was like, no! <laughs> okay, for you. <yeah. laughs> okay. As um, uh, Beth said, I'm going to talk about the Benedict Center. Uh, I've been involved with Benedict Center for probably uh, four to five years. Um, I first served on, the, or I still am serving on the Friends of the Board of Benedict Center. And then uh, I'm now on the board of directors um, and have been on that board for a couple of years. So I'm going to begin first with a video uh, that we produced this fall. The Benedict Center is recognized as a leader in part because we have been innovative trailblazers helping women in the justice system since 1974. Women make up a minority of the overall criminal justice population and they have unique needs as women. They're more likely to have a substance use disorder, they're more likely to have been victimized by violence and be suffering from trauma, and they're mothers. They're not just a statistic. They had goals and values and dreams and you know, something happened and they ended up on this side. 
What people don't realize is women on the streets face so much violence. Because they have been through so much. The Benedict Center has shown their compassion throughout the years for women. Milwaukee County has a philosophy of a no wrong door policy. We don't give up on people. The Benedict Center is a trusted partner for us. When we help women become healthier, we significantly impact the lives of children in our community. The Benedict Center works with women in the street-based sex trade, many of whom have experienced great violence, including trafficking and exploitation. We have two neighborhood drop-in centers and a street outreach van that is able to connect with women, build trust with them, and begin that journey towards a safer and better life. When I set out in the morning, my goal is to work, engage, and provide them with basic needs, food, clothes, shelter. I'm able to get them connected with case managers. I'm able to connect them to resources that's in the community. Whatever that woman is needing at that time, we try to provide. We'd like for people to know that we have programs to reach women at every different point along the continuum of the criminal justice system. We're a licensed outpatient behavioral health clinic providing the substance use treatment, mental health treatment that women need so that they can begin their healing journey. We provide a diversion program so women can come here for treatment as an alternative to being incarcerated. We also have a program at the Milwaukee County House of Correction. It is a women's reentry program. There we can start working with women while they're incarcerated, and then we continue to work with them upon release and help them be successful in their reentry home to the community. I see the Benedict Center invested in women and not willing to give up and willing to fight when necessary to help improve the lives of women. The Benedict Center supports change long-term change. There's so many collateral consequences to incarceration, and unless we change the system to open those doors, people will be forever shut out. When you support and invest in the Benedict Center, you are helping open doors for women to their dreams, to their future, to their homes, to their children. When you support women, you're changing lives. It's not just that woman, it's the family, it's the community. It means so much to me just to see that transpire. Um, she's on her way. She's she's doing it. This does work. I truly believe in their mission. I really do. Okay, and that gives an overview of uh, the Benedict Center. Uh, before I uh, talk a little bit about the programs that uh, we offer, I'd like to give you a few statistics. <clears throat> there are more than a million women across the United States who are behind bars and under the control of the criminal justice system. Women are the fastest growing segment of the incarcerated population, increasing at nearly the double the rate of men since 1985. Between 1980 and 2017, the number of women incarcerated in the United States increased 750%, and African American women were incarcerated at twice the rate of white women, expanding at 4.6% annually between 1995 and 2005. Women now account for 7% of the population in state and federal prisons. An estimated 58,000 women every year are pregnant when they enter local jails or prisons, yet there is inadequate care available for them. Over the past 20 years, the war on drugs has caused significant rise in the number of women incarcerated and their access to adequate drug treatment. Most of the convictions of women that are incarcerated are for nonviolent offenses, um, <coughs> crimes like burglary, larceny, fraud. 40% um, are incarcerated because of drug use. 
Um, and that's usually drug use and possession rather than selling. Um, only about um, 18, a little less than 18% of the women are actually in there for violent conduct. Um, as uh, Jean said, many women have experienced extreme trauma. And so um, this is an example. 90%, 92% of all the women in the California prison system have experienced um, physical or sexual trauma at some time in their life. Um, black women uh, represent 30% of all incarcerated women in the United States, although they represent 13% of the female population. Hispanic women represent 16% of the incarcerated women, although they only make up 11% um, of the population. Um, two thirds of the mothers are ch are mothers. Two thirds of the women are mothers with minor children. So over 1.5 million children have a parent in prison in the United States, and more than 8.5 million children have a parent under correctional supervision, and more than one in five children of these children are under five. Um, and here's an interesting um, statistic. The United States is one of the top incarcerators of women in the world. Over 30% of the world's incarcerated women are in the United States, and the United States ranks first. So the Benedict Center has um, a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a little more briefly on the programs that we provide. One of the programs is the Women's Harm, Re Harm Reduction Program. Each year, 200 women are referred to the Women's Harm Reduction Program as a community-based treatment alternative to incarceration. Services include mental health and substance abuse treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, and groups to address trauma. The program also offers adult... Yes, it's Whoa. One of our <laughs> <laughs> Moving right on on to Jim Allen. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, I turned off the TV, so you're safe from here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the program also offers adult education, parenting, and employment classes and support. The underlying, the underlying um, strategy is to reduce the harm, um, which encourages strengths building, reduction in harmful behaviors, and improvement in key decision making leading towards a, a better life. So if the women, many of the women are um, drug users. So a harm reduction example would be to get them to, um, they take methadone as a treatment. Um, that you, you might say, well, they're still using a drug. They're not using an injectable drug. So that's a step in the right direction. So then the next step would be to try to get them off methadone. It's little baby steps along the way to get to the transformation. Uh, the Benedict Center also operates a women's re-entry program in Milwaukee County House of Corrections and serves over 250 women annually. Uh, the women at the um, HOC begin that process while they're actually incarcerated uh, with a specific, specifically divided curriculum to begin addressing trauma, addiction, and interpersonal violence. They increase their skills through cognitive behavioral therapy parenting, employment, mindfulness classes, and they create individual re-entry plans. Uh, beginning in 2017, the program now provides case management support for all the women as they leave uh, the House of Corrections. There's, they actually have a contact while they're with the Benedict Center, um, while they're in incarcerated, and then there's someone there to greet them when they leave the, leave the facility and accompany them through their um, journey of recovery. The Sisters Program, of which the Siebert Foundation has uh, very generously been supporting, helps over 400 women a year. Um, it's a street outreach, case management, and skill building program for women in street prostitution and or sex trafficking. The program is an innovative community police partnership and is gaining recognition as a more effective way to improve health and safety for women in communities. In fact, um, I believe that uh, they have won a national award um, and national recognition for their work there. 
Um, it also works on the harm reduction um, approach by, um, by street outreach, and then we have two drop-in centers um, in the north and the south of the Milwaukee area. The Community Justice Program is the fourth program, and the Benedict Center's direct services are mutually reinforcing efforts. The Benedict Center advocates for best practice and cost-effective policies for women in the criminal justice system. The current advocacy focuses, focus is to create a citywide prostitution diversion policy, which Jean mentioned, that will culminate in women being diverted to the expanded sisters program on the north and south sides. This represents a shift from criminalizing women in the sex trade and instead provides a public health approach that helps the women address issues including violence, trauma, poverty, and addiction while treating them with dignity and respect. Uh, one thing that has happened since I've been on the board is that we have made some really important connections uh, with Housing First in Milwaukee. Housing is um, a really uh, critical issue in getting women off the streets and off drugs. Um, they even say that if they had a place that they could rest their heads and be have a safe, they they would um, you know they could really change their lives. So we've had some really great success stories in the last year or so with women who we've been able to connect with housing, um, and and it certainly um, is a credit to the county that they recognize the work of the Benedict Center, and that the uh, a county attorney also. Um, is on full on board. Uh, the only problems we seem to have is that our changing police chiefs, and some of them um, are very willing to participate in the diversion program, and some have not been. Now we have a very supportive police chief, so I think we're going to be able to even um, provide more services. Thank you. talk about Serenity Inns. I've been a, not on the board or anything. I've just been a very long-term volunteer and um, just I'm here to speak about my experience and what I know about Serenity Inns. Um, so Serenity Inns is a nonprofit. It's a three-phase program. It's a seventh-month program for um, recovering addicts and alcoholics. It's in the city of Milwaukee. Um, as Beth mentioned before, their mission is to offer opportunity for holistic recovery from addiction, alcoholism, to men who need it most in a compassionate community of accountability. So um, just this week, a new director was announced um, due to um, Ellen Blathers, who had been the director for quite a number of years, retired, I kind of lost track, somewhere in there in COVID. Um, so there was an interim director. The new director is um, going to start on December 6th. So I don't really know what that's going to bring, if there'll be any changes as a result of that. His name is Kenneth Ginlack Sr. That's a, um, I don't know too much. I do know, if you want more information, I have access to that. Um, Serenity Inn opened up in 2004. Um, a house was purchased before that. Um, it was ready in 2004 for residents. Um, <laughs> And also, in addition to the House of Recovery, there's also an alumni house, which opened in 2016, so it's only been open for about five years. And that is for graduates of the program um, to live. It's affordable housing, it's um, drug-free, it's um, independent living. Um, one of the problems they were noticing when someone did graduate from the program, you know, they don't necessarily have a financial record, they can't get, you know, can't get a rental property there, you know, they're not a good candidate for a lease. So this gives uh, someone an opportunity to have that independence, to create that track record, and then um, go on from there. I there's not really a set amount of time that they can stay there, so sometimes they're there for a year or more. It, it just kind of depends. I do believe they still do drug testing there, so they can um, uh, be asked to leave if they're not following the rules. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's a safe place, and for some of the um, men who are 
really serious and feel like they need that, they it's very well they very much welcome that. Um, so I wasn't going to talk too much about Serenity Inns and their program necessarily. I mean, they have a very like I mentioned, it's three steps and it's very specific the program they have for the residents. So, um, but how St. Matthew participates is there's a dinner fellowship program. So every night of the month they try to schedule somebody to bring in dinner. Usually there's churches, there's some individuals that do it. They have a calendar on their website. Um, the, so there's maximum 12 residents plus one innkeeper who's just so somebody's always there overnight with them. And what Dinner Fellowship is about is bringing a prepared meal. So you bring it prepared to um, eat. It's warm, whatever you need. It's warm, it's ready to serve. There's not really a full kitchen there, and that's intentional because it's not intended to be like a home that they stay at for a long term. Um, and you know, it's men. I, I don't, you know, I don't like to eat meat a lot, but it's men, and you know, always a meat, some sides, and um, dessert, and things like that. So a full meal. Um, there have been some changes during COVID um, be because of. <coughs> The ministry has always been about sitting down and having dinner together, and obviously with COVID that changed. Um, there's been three options during COVID. You can either just drop off the meal, they'll come and get it from your car. Um, you can order it. They, there's a few uh, chosen places like order pizza or something like that and have it delivered. Um, or you can dine in. Now, I have started dining in again a couple months ago. Um, I do believe that the residents are when I asked, they were all vaccinated. Um, and it's a very structured situation. They greet, they greet us when we, when we get there, they come out to the car, they carry everything in, you know, we say hi, um, they set everything up. You actually go down into the basement, it's just the basement it's with a counter and a microwave and a fridge, and um, they set everything up. And then we, you know, so many things, we used, we used to join hands, we don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, start, um, somebody is assigned to lead a prayer, a pre-meal prayer, so we, we do that. Um, you know, we're, we're considered the guests, so um, we serve our, fill our plate first and then sit down. And then another really important part of the, um, their program there is that not only are we sharing a meal together, but um, somebody's assigned to lead and ask a question. They ask a question of the residents and then they ask a question of us guests and everybody takes a turn and um, participates in that conversation. And you know that gives the um, residents an opportunity to share their story with each other and you know, it, um, it, all kinds of questions get asked. I mean, I've been asked like, where's your favorite place to go on vacation? I've been asked, you know, why what brings you back to Serenity, all kinds of different things. So it's, it's a wonderful conversation and it's, um, like I said, it's structured and it's polite and it's a lot of listening goes on. So, um, and I, I, one thing for, for me that really distinguishes the, this ministry at Serenity's Inns is that um, a lot of times people ask me like, oh, is it, you know, or do, do we serve the meal when we get there? And I always like to make the distinction that it's not serving, it's sharing a meal. Um, and that it's, um, yes, it's really about sitting down with somebody. We're not serving, we're not there to fix them, we're not doing, it's there to sit down. And I just, I um, was looking at a quote this morning, um, Henry Nowen, who's, uh, I really enjoyed this book. I read it a couple of years ago, and I think I'm going to reread it. It's just called Compassion, you know. And he kind of focuses on how compassion is not feeling separate. It's um, it's sitting down with somebody and witnessing. And um, his a quote that I have from him this morning is, "Compassion means full, a full immersion in the condition of being human." So it's just really, literally, sitting down with somebody and having dinner, and that can be very meaningful for the residents. Um, you know, they often have very sordid pasts, and you know, obviously there's a lot that's going on that's probably led them to where they are in life. Um, I was just gonna share one example of somebody that I've met. First time I met him was at the annual <clears throat> fundraiser that they do. He had only been in the program, I think a couple months. I happened to sit next to him, you know, at the dining, we were at, uh, 
uh, Italian Community Center. I met him, you know, I was able to talk with him. That was a couple years ago. Now he's, he um, graduated from the program. I believe he's still living at the alumni house. He's now the Sunday evening um, innkeeper, so when I go back, I get to see him um, every time. He's at MATC taking accounting classes. I'm a CPA, so I always, like, we talk accounting and stuff like that. So it's just been, um, yeah, I'm so happy for him, really. Um, and really all else I wanted to share is um, also we do participate, or, you know, I have, and I think I see other St. Matthew members there, they do have an annual celebration of recovery. We skipped one year, but just happened in September at the Italian Community Center. It's fundraiser auction. Um, um, Mike Stralo from uh, 58, Channel 58 usually MCs it. And then um, there's usually like a nomination of an alumni of a year, and they usually get up and share their story, which is, has a great impact. Um, and also, if you're interested in learning more about Serenadians, Mike Stralo, um, oh, yeah. he has that Sunday morning spotlight show, which is a local show. He did a story on Serenadians. It was in on August 4th of 2017, but I think that it's still applicable, the, um, the, sh um, the story that they did at that time. So, thank you. stand-in for Kristen Hansen, who is still recovering from surgery and wasn't able here to be here today to present about TOSA Cares. She is on the board, however. Oh, there we go. Okay. She is on the board, however, and um, can be reached by email, and she's a wealth of information about TOSA Cares. For those of you who don't know, um, it, it is a food pantry that exists in Mount Zion Lutheran Church. It was formed in about 2008 by a number of volunteers who were responding to need. Since then, it has grown into a pretty substantial food pantry that serves people in Wauwatosa and in Milwaukee. They were serving about 250 people with each distribution before COVID. Um, during the first months of COVID, they were seeing a pretty steady increase and in people they hadn't seen before. Um, after the relief checks, their, um, their numbers decreased a little bit, but now they're on the upswing, so they're preparing for 250 at their distributions. I was struck by what Kelly said of all the things that changed at Serenity Inn because of COVID. The same is true with TOSA Cares. One of the things that made them um, a really good food pantry was that they had a gathering time on Saturday morning. So people would come in and sit and um, have coffee. Often there would be a hot breakfast for them. Um, they would have healthcare professionals in, nurses, um, doing blood pressure checks. Once they had a massage um, <laughs> therapist in. So they really tried to respond to people's needs on multiple levels and create community. Tom Ertel, who is one of the founders, would go from table to table and pray with people. So it was a really a wonderful community approach to giving food that affirmed people's dignity. They also do some seasonal special items like backpacks in the fall, um, Christmas decorations at Christmas to try to um, respond to people's broader needs than food. Half of the food that we collect at St. Matthew's goes to Tosa Cares. They're still handing it out. They're not doing it in the way that they did it pre-COVID. Um, it's more of a drive up, as far as I know still. That may change in the coming months. But this is an um, organization that youth have volunteered with for years. We've done confirmation um, events with them where the kids will go and sort clothes and food. Um, we've had small groups serve hot breakfast, I think. Kelly, we might have been involved in that once. Some of you people have, have been involved in that. So it's a wonderful organization right here in Wauwatosa. The interesting thing about it, too, is that it lets kids see, at least when I've been there with kids, that hunger is here, too. There are people in school that they know, and one, it happened once to, to um, one of the kids I took, that they saw someone that they knew at school. They were getting food for their family. 
So it's an eye-opening experience. Um, they're also located next to an apartment that houses a lot of senior citizens, and um, they serve a lot of those people too who are living on a fixed income and are not quite able to get through the month. So it's a wonderful um, opportunity to volunteer when they're back up and running fully. Until then, they welcome your food all the time. They're collecting donations now for Thanksgiving turkeys. If you want to go to their website, you can easily donate. So that's about all I have to say. And Kristen Hansen, when she's back, can tell you even more. She's an awesome volunteer. <laughs> OK, thank you. Judy. Repairers of the Breach, ROTB, is unique in that it offers services to homeless people through the day. Many shelters provide a meal, perhaps, and a place to sleep overnight, but in the morning, uh, uh, people who have stayed there are expected to leave. Repairers of the Breach is housed in a three-story brick building down on 13th and Valite. It looks um, pretty ordinary from the outside, and the inside is jammed with things that are available for homeless people. When you come in, there is a counter that offers various snacks for someone who is hungry. There is a galley kitchen that uh, produces or distributes, one way or another, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There is, on the other side of the first floor, a pretty good-sized room that has a number of uh, easy chairs. And in front of each of those chairs is a big plastic tub, like a tote bot tub. And that made me so aware of one of the issues with being homeless. You think about your own situation, you know you've got closets, you've got dresser drawers, you've got cubby holes, you've probably got an attic or a basement or a garage, you've got plenty of places to put your stuff. If you are homeless, every blessed thing that you need to keep with you that you have. A toothbrush or a blanket, anything has to be carried with you. You've no storage space. It is a great comfort to the people who come in that they can put that burden down. It's in that tub, it is safe, it is dry, it is off of their hands or their back for the moment while they rest. There's also a wall full of lockers so that if one of the people is going, say, to a, an interview or a doctor's appointment or needs to, to be somewhere, they have a safe spot where they can leave their possessions for the day. If you go through the rest of the building, there are bathrooms here and there. There's a shower where people can get themselves cleaned up. There's a room that's full of clothes that's been donated and cleaned and sized. So if they need a new shirt or a, another jacket, they can come there and hopefully find something. There's a classroom where people can work on their um, literacy or their um, uh, equivalency degree. Um, there's a clinic for uh, minor, maybe not minor, but, but things that don't require a full-fledged doctor's appointment, you know, the blood pressure and that sort of thing. Um, there are quiet rooms. I'm not sure if that's quite what they call them, but it is a place where a person who comes in can get away from the stress of being constantly approached with things or 
uh, things are asked of them or they are demanded, why are you here or get out of here, that sort of thing. A quiet room where they can simply get their emotions back under control. Uh, incidentally, this uh, repairs of the breach serves both men and women. Um, out, outdoors, one part of the yard has a number of raised bed gardens where they raise vegetables during the growing season that they use in their kitchen. And another part of the yard has a variety of um, picnic benches and tables so that people can come and rest there and not be hassled to get out of my space. That's their space. They can come. Um, then, how is St. Matt involved in this? Um, I'm not sure how long the program has been with St. Matthew's, but I became involved when I joined here six years ago, and I actually became more involved when the man who was doing a lot of the organizing and grocery shopping became more ill. Maybe you know Tom Guy. Mm -hmm. He is no longer able to do that, and I was asked if I could. So we have a number of people who are, are saying that the supplies are always there. Somebody who gets the juice boxes and the salty snacks and the cookies, and somebody, uh, I think the office staff actually keeps a constant supply of those brown paper lunch bags and the sandwich bags and the snack bags. And I take care of the uh, perishables, so each time we are, which is twice a month, each, each of those times I go to the grocery store and get the, the bread and the lunch meat and the cheese and the spread that we're using for making sandwiches. Then there's another whole group of people who have volunteered to come and provide fresh fruit. And so perhaps three times a year their name comes up on this rotating list and they will provide on the Sunday that we're packing lunches a hundred pieces of fruit apples, bananas, oranges, whatever, whatever stays fairly secure in a lunch bag. Um, and then on Sundays, usually, although as with many things, COVID did change the routine, but uh, what has been and is now starting to re reoccur is that volunteers are asked to come down between the services on the week when we are preparing lunches and the sandwiches are made, the lunch bags are packed with juice and fruit and uh, the sandwich and cookies and a piece of fruit. That's put in big plastic tubs. Then another volunteer takes those tubs over to the uh, repairs of the breach building and then they distribute them to the people who need a lunch. Either they're, they're having a lunch because they have no place to go or they're having a lunch because they're going out to a job and they need to have something to eat in the middle of the day. Uh, if any of you are interested in becoming one of the people that supplies the fruit, uh, we will be preparing the list for 2022 within the next few weeks. So speak to Sue Swing or Gretchen or somebody in the office and say, you'd like to be one of the volunteers that provides fruit. Otherwise, you come down on Sundays when we're having the, the lunch packing session. That's um, what St. Matt's does for repairs of the breach. Well, this is about repairs of the no, breach. Yeah, I know. No, 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 I can get this um, working because I have a few slides and then a short video I'm hoping to show you. Turn it. Okay. Ah. All right, great. Well, good morning. Thank you, Beth, for inviting me here to present today. 
I'm Michelle Burmeister, and my husband Rob and I have been members at St. Matthew's for I think 16 or 17 years now. Um, we have two kids, Evelyn and Robbie, and for the last five and a half years, I've been the communications director and senior program officer for the Siebert Lutheran Foundation. And um, also here today is Siebert's president, Charlotte John Gomez. Yes, give her a round of applause. She deserves it. And um, she'll help me answer any questions during the Q&A when we're finished here. <clears throat> um, so the Siebert Lutheran Foundation was created in 1976 after Albert F. Siebert, the founder of Milwaukee Electric Tool Company, um, now Milwaukee Tool as we know it, um, designated $35 million, um, which was his entire ownership in the company, to a trust. And as stated in his last will and testament, these funds were dedicated to spreading the gospel, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and alleviating human suffering. Today, the foundation is governed by an independent board of directors, um, anywhere from nine to 13 Lutherans, from three of the largest Lutheran denominations in the state of Wisconsin. So those are the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or ELCA, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, or the LCMS, and the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, which is the Wells Synod. And Mr. Siebert's original $35 million has grown to a corpus of $124 million today. So what does Siebert Lutheran Foundation do with these funds? Well, you've actually heard a little bit about it already um, with the Benedict Center and Serenity Inns. Those are two organizations that um, we do fund. But we focus on funding ministries and projects based in Lutheran churches and organizations that are working to achieve one or more objectives within our three funding priorities. And Beth mentioned those when she was introducing us. So those are growing the body of Christ, educating while sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and serving as the hands and feet of Christ. Seabird's funding is focused on the state of Wisconsin, and for two of our funding priorities, educating and serving, we specifically fund only in Milwaukee, Waukesha, Racine, and Kenosha counties. Many of Seabird's funded programs are also familiar to St. Matthew's members, as I've mentioned. Um, in our growing category are ministries that share the gospel and support current and future church leaders, such as Lutheran Campus Ministry of Greater Milwaukee. You probably are familiar with St. Matt or um, Pastor Matt's involvement in that ministry. Um, Redeemer Lutheran Church's expansion and renovation. They're a church in Milwaukee near Marquette University's campus that's doing really wonderful things with community outreach there or Lutherdale Summer Camp, which many of your children or grandchildren may have attended or are attending in the future. In Seabird's educating category, we focus on Christ-centered K through eight schools, high schools, universities, and school support programs. Ministries in that category include things like St. Marcus Lutheran School, Milwaukee Lutheran High School, Wisconsin Lutheran High School, or organizations like the Lutheran Counseling and Family Services of Wisconsin. They do school-based counseling in many Lutheran schools in Milwaukee. And in our serving category, Siebert provides funding to ministries that meet basic needs and to programs that support pathways to stability and empowerment for disadvantaged people. Many of the ministry, ministries we fund, as I mentioned, are also supported by St. Matthew's members with volunteer time and financial resources. Um, some of these include, aside from the ones we've already heard from today, um, things Serenity Inns, Lutheran Social Services, Hep of the Lutheran Church, and Just One More Ministry, which I know many of you are very familiar with and probably have been involved with in the past as well. God is working through hundreds of Lutheran organizations in Southeast Wisconsin. And before I worked for Siebert Lutheran Foundation, I don't think I understood the extent of Lutheran power from a service standpoint in our region and our state. It's pretty fantastic. It's amazing what people are doing. And the people doing his work are improving lives and bringing Jesus's love to others through their service. Um, an example I want to share is Allie, a UWM student who participated in Lutheran campus ministry, shared that at one time she was scared, timid, and shy, but then said that Lutheran campus ministry has encouraged me to use my leadership skills, become more vulnerable, grow my spiritual gifts, trust myself, and use my voice to speak out about my faith 
and those on the margins of society. And that is really what Siebert's work is all about. We provide funding. Oh, did I go up? We provide funding that supports life-giving programs and initiatives that are improving communities in our region. So, like I said, the previous slides were just an example of some of what Siebert funds in any given year. In 2020, we granted. I'm talking loud so you can hear me if the microphone goes out. In 2020, we granted 3.72 million dollars to 86 different organizations. And our 2021 grant information is being compiled as we speak, and we'll be sharing that information soon on our website if you want to see what our granting in 2021 looked like. In addition to funding Lutheran-affiliated ministries and programs, Siebert also supports donors who want to increase their philanthropic impact in the Lutheran community. This new initiative called Siebert Serves is focused on bringing more awareness and therefore more funding to support organizations that are Christ-centered and doing work to grow and glorify the kingdom. Siebert funds approximately $4 million in grants a year, as I mentioned, but there are so many more needs and opportunities than we can possibly fund by ourselves as a foundation. So Siebert invites others um, who have similar passions to join with us, create more collective impact than we or any individuals can do on their own. So I have a, a two minute video that I'm gonna play that'll give you a little bit more information about Siebert Serves. <laughs> Every day I get to come into the office to learn more about what our grantee partners are doing and the impact that they're making. And that makes me most grateful because people are being so generous and really following Mr. Siebert's legacy of generosity. My original attraction to Siebert was because of the depth of their nonprofit knowledge in the Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin community. Not only was it a depth of knowledge, but it also reached a vast community. There were different organizations to address food needs, education, and ministry. To be able to partake of that knowledge in making decisions about where our money will go was not only rewarding, but I felt like we were using as much of that money as we could in a leveraged way to extend the benefits as far as we possibly could. We had a recent donor event where we had multi-generational families with little ones sitting on the mom's lap and learning about the abundance of generosity and what that looks like. We appreciate being included because it is about passing on values to the next generation and opportunities to share what you have to just show the gratitude for what you've been given. The collaborative event made it fun to be able to participate with them in making some of those decisions. In terms of trust, they have maximized, as you see, the growth of the assets they have under management. They have done a great job of stewardship. We also have that professional due diligence process so people can feel confident that the money that they're investing is going to a place where they're going to make impact with their funds. The idea that we are giving back to our community and where we started from, and it's all going back into Milwaukee to make us a better city. We are inviting other donors to align their resources, their missions with ours, so that together we can have a greater collective impact. It feels good to do something good for somebody else. As you can see, we are passionate about sharing our grantee partners' stories and celebrating the generosity of donors who are supporting Lutheran organizations. Um, one of the schools featured in that video was Kingdom Prep Lutheran High School. I'm not sure if you know, they're right up the road across from Owatosa Cemetery in the former Pius High School building. And they're a really wonderful high school that um, started about four years ago serving young men um, from Milwaukee. Um, about 99% are African American and they have some really neat programs and missions with community outreach and helping seniors and doing things in the community here. So that's right, right up the road in our backyard if you're interested in learning more about what they're doing there. Oh, sorry. Every day. I know you wanted to watch it again. But. <laughs> okay, great. 
So you will find a lot more information about Siebert Lutheran Foundation, Siebert Serves, and the ministries that we fund on our website at siebertfoundation.org. Or please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Charlotte with any questions that don't get answered during the Q&A today. So thank you so much for having us. Oh, sure. Um, Ed tells me we have to be done at 1045 exactly. Um, so, and my idea, I love these things where we have groups of people getting together like this and telling um, other people about our organization because it turns out that some of my former students are now students at Kingdom Prep. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Where did you teach? So, I taught at Risen Savior. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Risen Savior is another school yeah. that Siebert supports as well on the north side. Yeah, that's and great. And St. Marcus, um, my family goes there. So. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Anyway, um, so to... um, we ha I'd like people to come up to the microphone and talk if anybody has any questions. Does anybody have any questions for a specific organization at all? Um, I did want to ask Diane, um, as long as I'm up here, had the microphone. Uh, with Benedict Center, I know you know a lot of these women have children, and so I was wondering if Benedict Center has any way of um, supporting the children of some of the women who are dealing with incarceration or anything, or? Uh, I, that, that's a question I'll have to find the answer okay. to. I, I think most of the children are um, taken care of by family, okay. uh, or they end up in the foster care system. Mm. I was also going to say that if anybody would like to get involved with Benedict Center, um, <clears throat> there's a brochure there and a wish list of needs that the women have um, if you care to um, uh, get involved that way. Also, uh, the Friends of the Benedict Center uh, board would be happy to have, um, join us as friends. Uh, so if you are interested, you can go to the website and um, there'll be a, there's a spot in getting involved that you can click on and join uh, friends. Uh, we do a couple of activities every year to raise money for the for the Benedict Center and for their, some of their needs, and we support the women with um, some dinners. We just handed out 50, 50 Thanksgiving boxes with uh, food and a gift certificate for a ham or a turkey um, so they can have a complete uh, Thanksgiving dinner. So if you'd like to get involved, um, you can see me, um, or there's certainly the website you can any other questions? Thank you to all our presenters today, and thank you to both of you who came to listen to this. Thank you for arranging it.